Well, thanks for listening. I'm Caleb Hudson, and that was a live recording from a solo recital I performed at the University of North Texas with Michael Schneider on piano. I love the music of Schubert, and I really love great craftsmanship, so I thought I'd put them together and showcase the brilliant work of master instrument maker Anton Poseger in Austria, and I wanted to do it in a cinematic way. So hopefully you enjoyed some of those details. So last week I asked you on Instagram to ask me some questions to answer in this video, and I got tons of questions, great questions, and I wanted to rapid fire answer as many as I could right now. So be sure to follow me on Instagram and let me know below in the comments what you'd like to see in future videos. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe if you'd like, hit the notification bell, and if you want, hit like on the video. Okay, so Jonathan wants to know, how do you structure your practice to balance growth, performances, and teaching? That's a really good question, and I think the key word is balance, and I think balance is something that we have to continue to think about. In my practicing itself, I try to have balance between three mindsets, and those mindsets are exploratory mindset, growth mindset, and performance mindset. So in the exploratory mindset, oftentimes we can be trying to find a new, better way to execute something so that whatever we hear in our head, that artistic intuition can come out in a more effortless, more consistent, more effective way for our listener. In the growth mindset, we found that that kind of path forward and we're just we're trying to repeat successful repetitions to gain consistency and in, in the performance mindset as much as possible we try to leave that analytical mindset behind and try to devote our entire selves to completing that artistic vision to really executing it without that criticism now there's a balance and i think that being analytical has its place but you also have to make sure that you're giving yourself time to practice the performance mindset because it takes practice. If you've ever been on stage and started thinking analytically about how to accomplish X, then you need that balance. So in terms of teaching, for me, teaching has been the single most useful thing for my playing. So when I first approached teaching, in the back of my mind I thought, okay, this might take away from my performance, um, I might develop teacher chops and not be able to execute at my highest level at all times. But what I found was that I made more growth, quicker growth in my playing than at any point in my career previously. And I think that's because the mindset that it puts you in to be a teacher and to try to identify with what your students are trying to accomplish uh, mechanically, musically, conceptually. It helps you sort out your own related challenges. And they're always related, even if it's a completely, seemingly different problem that a student has, or challenge that a student has, it's always related to something that can make your own path excel. Brian says, what is the most useful career skill you wish you'd learned while in conservatory? That's a really good question. And we can talk about like the nature of institutions and what to, re what to expect from institutions and what they're great for and what they're not so good for. Uh, for me, I, I, I do wish that I would have learned more about business and production. Being on tour with Canadian Brass, at first when I joined, I had no idea all of the pieces of the puzzle that have to be put together to make a concert happen. From management, to tour schedule, to logistics, to cultivating relationships with presenters, to audio, to video, to branding and marketing and strategy, uh, to collaborating with conductors and composers, and just learning how to communicate in, in a respectful way and an efficient way as well. There's way more to this field than what you learn in the conservatory classroom. Uh, institutions aren't always a natural environment for keeping up with the technological and entrepreneurship trends of the time. And they're not really meant to be. They provide the potential for a community where you can interact with others that are like-minded and uh, it leads to this kind of creative discovery. And if you can find those people at the institution, then that's the most valuable thing, I think so. That's what I was fortunate to find. And by the way, that's both teachers and your peers. So. You have to put a lot of effort into finding those people, finding finding your tribe. Okay, next question. Your concepts about Haydn Trumpet Concerto and how to practice it. Good timing, because I just released a book called The Haydn Sidekick. And this basically takes the most challenging parts of the concerto 
and it illuminates my approach and my methodical way of going about growing through those technical challenges. And I'm going to link it in the description below so you can check it out. It's a digital download. Okay, Leonard wants to know, how should I approach practicing trumpet after a year off due to COVID? Okay, so I would recommend when you pick it back up, just start with something you love. Start with simple songs. Leave the trumpet out all day where you can walk by it multiple times a day. And every time you walk by, pick it up, play simple melody. Don't play anything that's going to kill your morale. You know, like high lip trills or soft isolated attacks. At first, stick to things that you love to do. And kind of, if it's been a year, find a way to rediscover your passion and your, your joy for making music. Not feeling like you have to get back in shape really quickly. Just have your trumpet out all day and walk by, play a little bit and go on with your day. Chris asks, when was the moment you knew you could do this full time as a career? Um, you know, there was really no single moment for me. Um, it, this is an instrument that has always kind of held my imagination captive. And I remember when I started playing in the fifth grade, when I was 10 years old, um, I remember practicing and kind of looking out the window and like daydreaming about doing this on stage. And especially when I would listen to recordings, um, listen to recordings of Wynton Marsalis, Maurice Andre, um, Timothy Dachitzer, and and just imagine myself doing what I was hearing. That kind of daydreaming still hasn't stopped, you know? The spark hasn't really died at all. The fire kind of keeps burning and, you know, the hunger keeps growing. Okay, Joseph asks, how important is a degree as a performer in the music industry? So as a performer, I don't see the degree as being essential in order to winning auditions, whether it's for orchestra or chamber ensemble or or developing a solo career. That being said, what the institution provides you with that is really hard to find a student that is motivated and confident enough to do on their own is to be plugged into a community. Because music is it's a social thing. Like, what is music without playing with others? That's when you grow the most, not in the practice room by yourself. You grow the most when you're with others playing music. That's part of the reason COVID was so hard because all these performances were canceled. We weren't rehearsing together. We weren't like kind of creating something together, which is, that is the point of making music. That's what the institution provides, bringing other like-minded people to the same place. Having people around you to listen to that are better than you, that can kind of push you in a supportive way. Um, having teachers that can guide you, but also taking initiative within that environment to get the most out of it and to grow. And without that experience, it's possible to really reach your potential, I'm sure, but it's really difficult to, to continually be forming ensembles, creating projects, uh, doing recordings outside of that kind of that studio environment that you would find in a conservatory or a university. But as an educator in the music industry, it's very important to have a degree, I would say. Okay, so Kevin wants to know, how can I produce a beautiful sound with a piccolo trumpet? Tell us your experience. Okay, so listening and imitating, and not just to piccolo trumpet players, but also to oboe players, violin players, flute players as well. If you want some specific recommendations, write down in the comments below and I'll give you some. I would say a lot of soft playing on, on the big horn, on B flat to develop that easy dolce vocal approach because it really is a different animal playing piccolo trumpet. You can't force it to work like you can on the B flat or C trumpets. I would say for those of you who are younger or wondering, am I ready to start playing piccolo trumpet? Um, first of all, talk to your teacher. But second of all, I would say a good prerequisite on B flat trumpet is, are you able to play in the high register, somewhat soft, in an agile way, and flexible. So there were tons of equipment questions. So if you'd like, I can make a, a separate video on all of my equipment, kind of like a what's in my case kind of video. So leave a comment if you'd like to see that or any other topics you'd like to see. Okay, next question. Who are your favorite sound models? Yeah, so I don't like to separate the idea, the concept of sound from voice. So when I listen to my, some of my favorite trumpet players, the first names that come to mind are Doc Schitzer, uh, Phil Smith, Wynton Marsalis. But I would also say Philip Cobb and Juliana Summerhalder are players that really, like, when they play, it grips me. And those are just names off the top of my head. I'm sure I could think of a bunch of others. Uh, and also non-trumpet players that I uh, listen to to imitate. Yasha Heifetz, 
Ian Bostridge, so I was actually listening a lot to Ian Bostridge, his Schubert album, to really replicate a lot of his nuances and gestures when I performed that piece on flugelhorn. Those are a few sound models, but there's almost an infinite number. So I think that's about it for now. I wanna know who are your favorite sound models? What do you think about getting a music degree? Is there a purpose to it, to be a performer? How many of you want to be a full-time performer? What are your questions? I'll see you guys in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I will see you in the next video.